Where did we come from? The Bible says, in the beginning, God created. Evolution teaches the opposite. No one created. It all happened by itself. Which one is the truth? This is Headquarters. Doc M. Jackie. And Rich. Their job? Investigate and discover the truth. This is The Creation Case. Hi, Jackie. You have some new plants. Yeah, this semester in school, we're learning about botany, including edible plants. Really? Oh, this one here, here. it's called Petrocellinum crispum. Looks kind of like... Or parsley. Parsley? Yeah. I like parsley. Hmm. You know, I, I forgot that one's name. I'm gonna... I think I put it in this folder. Oh, here it is. Oh yeah, it's the poisonous Visio plants. Yeah, you do not want to eat one of these. First, after you eat it, you, you can't feel your face. Then after that, you can't really control your tongue. Then your vision goes a little blurry. And then your cheeks get all bloated. Yeah, not a pretty sight. You didn't eat one of them, did you? You ate one? Okay, so you're either baking it really good or or you, you really ate one. Yeah? Well, don't worry. The effect wears off after a while. Is this Rich's new assignment? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I'm just gonna read it. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm gonna read it. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, it says, Dear Doc M, I love plants. My dad loves gardening and my mom has plants all over the house. I'm learning to take care of them. When I grow up, I wanna be a botanist and work with plants as my job. I was wondering, if plants and trees are something that God made, what do they tell us about creation? Uh -huh. Thank you, Alex, Green Bay, Wisconsin. So, should I send this over to Rich? Um, okay, I'll take that as yes, yeah. Um, where's Rich today? Uh -huh. Well, last I heard, he was stuck on a mountain trying to figure out how to get down. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, well, I'm gonna send this over to him, okay? Uh, just, just hang in there, Doc, all right? Yeah, all right. You're gonna be fine, okay? After a while. Do you have a creation question for headquarters? Send your questions to Doc, Jackie, and Rich by visiting our website at thecreationcase.com. What a fun way to come down off a mountain. All right, where's my phone? I think I got a message. It must be HQ with a new assignment. Let's check it out. Hi, Rich. I hope you figured out a way to get off that mountain you were telling me about. Oh, yeah. We have your next assignment, and it's a little different. Hmm, interesting. 
We need you to investigate plants. Did she say plants? You heard me correctly, plants. We want to know if the world of botany, which of course is the study of plants, provides any evidence of creation. As usual, we look forward to getting your report. Oh, hold on a sec. Doc M wants to tell you something too. Um, let me translate for you. He said if you find a poisonous Vizio plant, don't eat it. Hmm, that is different. Sounds fun though. Let me let HQ know I got the message. Got it. Plants. Avoid poisonous ones. Well, this should be interesting. Let me write this down in my journal. Botany. That's the study of plants. All right, where should we begin? Obviously, little plants like this are pretty young. We need to see some of the oldest and some of the largest plants in the world, like sequoias. I would think they could provide us some good clues about creation. Come on, let's go. Help us investigate today. Download and print your own free journal study guide at thecreationcase.com. Giant sequoias are the largest trees on the planet. There's also the redwood trees that are not as massive, but actually grow taller than the sequoias. Both grow here in California. Sequoias only grow in high elevations, usually between four and 7,000 feet above sea level. The first time you walk up to one of these giants, it's pretty impressive. The tallest sequoias can reach almost 300 feet tall, and the tallest redwoods almost 400 feet tall. Whoa! Aren't these trees amazing? They're huge! So, I know what you're thinking. How old are these trees? As you can imagine, they are some of the oldest trees on the planet. Scientists here who study these trees have estimated that the trees here are over 3,000 years old. That means these trees were here before the Declaration of Independence was written, before the Pilgrims landed, even before Christopher Columbus sailed across the Atlantic to the New World. The amazing thing is that some of these trees were already a thousand years old when Jesus walked on the earth. You know, as long as these trees are alive, they keep on growing. The interesting thing is that scientists have searched all over and they've never found one that died of old age. They just keep living. The oldest sequoia that we know about is about 3,000 years old and it's still growing. Whoa, check out this one. I think I'm gonna sketch this one. I think I'm gonna get a little bit higher to get a better angle so I can sketch. You know, scientists say there's no reason to believe they couldn't live another 3,000 years or more. If that's so, then why don't we find some really old trees or at least clues of old trees that lived a long time ago. Calculations from the Bible tell us that the flood was a few thousand years ago. If that's true, then we wouldn't find trees that are more than a few thousand years old living today. Even though scientists say that these trees should be able to live for even tens of thousands of years, we don't find trees with nearly that amount of tree rings. These are pretty old trees, but they're not the oldest trees on the planet. That honor goes to the bristlecone pine. 
it's getting late. And the place that we're gonna go check out Bristlecone Pine Trees is in Colorado. We gotta get back to the Jeep, come on. Our trip from California has taken us deep into the Rocky Mountain Range in Colorado. Well, we are at 11,500 feet. We're getting close, come on. We're gonna have to hike in a little ways to get to the place where the bristlecone pines are growing. It's amazing that these trees only grow at such high elevations like this and in such harsh conditions. Even in the middle of the summer, there's still snow on the ground up here. Hey, here's a couple of bristle cone pine trees. They are pretty cool looking. I'm kind of out of breath. I think I'm gonna take a break. Notice the twisting trunks of these trees. They twist like that and that actually gives them a stronger foundation. The trees here in this grove are only about 1600 years old. That sounds like a lot, but it's actually not very old compared to the oldest ones that we know of, which are about 4,500 years old. Just like the sequoias, scientists believe that these trees can also keep growing for thousands of more years. If these trees can grow for thousands and thousands of years, why then are the oldest ones we find only 4,500 years old? So why don't we find older dead ones that used to live before them? Hmm, I'm gonna write this in my journal. There are scientists that claim some trees are much older, but I've never heard of trees found with tens of thousands of rings. Bristlecone pines seem to grow forever, but aren't found more than a few thousand years old. It's like plant life suddenly started on this planet about 4,500 years ago. Hmm, that's only a few thousand years ago. That's around the time of the flood. Interesting. Wow, look at all these bristlecone pine trees. Beautiful, amazing. Have you ever touched one of these pine trees and gotten that sticky stuff all over your hands? That stuff is called resin and sometimes it drips out of the tree and hardens. Sometimes a bug lands in that resin and gets stuck in there and it dies. Once the resin is dried and hardened, it's called amber. Check it out, I got a piece here with me and it even has a little insect trapped inside of it. According to the theory of evolution, they say some of these insects have been buried inside amber for a hundred million years. There's a problem though. The insects and creatures that we find inside of amber are unchanged compared to the way we see them today. After a hundred million years, it doesn't look like anything has changed with these bugs. And after all, reptiles supposedly changed into mammals in a hundred million years, but nothing changed here. Take your typical ant. We find them in amber all the time, but after a hundred million years, they still haven't changed. Ants are still ants. Think about it. We're probably talking about 500 million generations of ants and no change. Maybe a hundred million years didn't go by. Maybe God created ants only a few thousand years ago and they're still ants today. One of the biggest challenges for evolution is the lack of transitional species. As I said earlier, evolution teaches that reptiles evolved into mammals. Not in one step, of course, but the actual fossil evidence doesn't prove they were ever related to each other. The fossils look more like extinct creatures with no relation. 
The change from reptile to mammal is much more complicated than most people realize. For example, from laying eggs to live birth and milk production. From scaly skin to hairy and furry skin. Going from being cold-blooded to being warm-blooded. And completely new ways of breathing. Plus, reptile to mammal evolution would actually be considered one of the most similar types of evolution between creatures. And imagine bigger changes, like fish with gills changing into mammals that breathe with lungs, or walk on four legs, or fly with wings, or creatures with skeletons on the outside, like insects, evolving into creatures with skeletons on the inside, like frogs. Of course, they claim it happened in steps over millions of years, but is there evidence? If evolution were true, there would be a huge trail of evidence showing how and when all these changes happened. But evidence of those changes have not been found. The same goes for plants and trees. The fossil record still doesn't show how they could have evolved. They just appear all of a sudden, fully formed, highly complex, and with huge varieties. I find this all a little too hard to believe. As we dig around for evidence in botany, we need to go visit a place with a high concentration of biomass, that's living things. We need to go to a rainforest. We need to go to one of the only temperate rainforests in the lower 48 states. So we better get going, come on. Hi everyone, it's Doc M here at HQ. Today here at HQ we have several investigations going on. It's crazy. One of them has to do with our world's population. You know every 10 years the United States counts how many people are living here. It's called a census. Remember, when Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary had to go back to Bethlehem on little donkey so they could be counted in the census. The interesting thing about a census is that they show us the amount of people on the planet is growing. Every day there's more and more people in the world. All around the world, more and more. Here's how it looks like on paper. This is the years that have gone by. This is today, and then this is 2000, and then we have 1600, and 1100, all the way back to the time when Jesus was born. Censuses have been going on since before Jesus, so we have a pretty good idea of how many people were around back then. This line here on the side shows how many billion people there are on Earth. It goes all the way up to seven billion, and that's about where we are today. Ah, so I'm gonna take my marker. So let's put a dot. Today, 2000. How about 1800? All the way down to one billion. We can easily project as far back as when Jesus was born when there was around 200 million people. Now here's the fun part. Maybe you've already done this in math class and you're a great mathematician but we can draw a line between the dots to show how the population has increased over the last 2,000 years. Starting with Jesus, we would just draw this line up through our dots and we could see the growth. That's pretty cool, huh? Here's the great part though. Even if we don't have a census from too far before Jesus was born, we can follow this line backwards down to zero people by just doing a little math. By using some math calculations and known growth rates, the lines run down to only a few people. Let's do it. Here we go. Jesus going back, going back, going back, going back, going back, going back. All the way to the flood when there were only eight people that made it on the ark alive. Ha, you remember the story of Noah? Yeah, it's a great story. Now wait a second. 
Evolution teaches that people have been around for way longer than 5,000 years. The problem is that the curve we just made shows it's not possible that people were around a million years ago. If people were around that long ago, you know how many people would be on our planet by now if we follow this curve? <laughs> Here's how many. One billion, trillion, killion, zillion, million. I know, I know that's a, a big number. I don't even know how to say it. It's one with 2,000 zeros behind it. Let's try. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Oh, I'm already tired. And we have a lot of zeros to go. Clearly, there are not that many people on our planet Earth right now. Yeah, estimates like these will never give us fully accurate numbers. But it sure seems strange that humans would be around for hundreds of thousands of years. Then suddenly, only a few thousand years ago, they started building cities and developing agriculture. Yet again, this is why I believe God is my creator. Hey everyone, it's me, Rich Aguilera. I'd love to see you at one of our live events. To see where I'll be speaking, visit our website, thecreationcase.com. Oh, hi. No, this isn't a rainforest. I decided to stop and take a break and check out this grass. I think the nicest grasses are found at a golf course. I mean, look at this stuff. I could take a nap in it. Everyone loves a nice, green, grassy yard. Do we know where it came from? Well, the Bible tells us that grass was created on day three. On the other hand, according to evolution, grass evolved about 55 million years ago. But recently, we've discovered dinosaur droppings showing that dinosaurs ate grass. That sounds logical, except evolutionary theory used to think grass appeared after dinosaurs lived. Scientists have actually found many different varieties of grass in dinosaur droppings. So grass and dinosaurs definitely existed at the same time. Yeah, that's definitely a problem. Dinosaurs eating grass when grass supposedly hasn't evolved yet? So now what? Well, the evolutionary theory had no choice but to change their story and believe that grass evolved earlier. I'm glad they admitted their mistake, but it sure must be frustrating to believe in something that is constantly changing. I'm glad the Bible doesn't have to change its story all the time to match what we see in nature. That's because God created science and nature. Welcome to one of the only temperate rainforests in all of the lower 48 states. Come on, let's check this out. A temperate rainforest is one of the places on Earth with the highest concentration of biomass. That's the total amount of living things in one place. A temperate rainforest is also a place that gets a lot of rainfall, but the weather remains pretty cool most of the year. Check out all these trees and plants here. And look at that one over there. It's growing on top of a tree, not in the ground. Mosses, ferns, lichen, these plants are called epiphytes, plants that grow on top of other plants. It's interesting to see two plants like this living together. It reminds me of symbiotic relationships we find in nature. That's when two organisms rely on each other for survival. For example, flowers make nectar that attracts bees. 
Both the flower and the bee have the perfect shape so that the bee can reach the nectar while at the same time a bunch of pollen is rubbed onto the bee's body. Actually, I have a close-up picture of a bee here on my phone. While this bumblebee is collecting nectar to make their own special honey, it's also carrying around a bunch of pollen. The bee gets the nectar that it needs to make honey, and the flower gets its pollen moved around so it can keep on growing. They work together, and they were designed that way to survive. This causes a problem for evolution. How would these two organisms evolve? If the bee doesn't have a certain shape, it can't get to the nectar, which means it can't distribute the pollen for the flower. If the bee and the flower aren't exactly as they are right now, neither would survive very well. Don't you find it hard to believe the chance luck that symbiotic relationships would have evolved perfectly in order for each to survive? I find it a little hard to believe that all this would happen by itself so perfectly. Plants and rock layers actually create a problem for evolution. You see, sometimes plants are fossilized in rock layers. I have a sample here that you can see. This is a fossilized fern. You can easily tell it was buried alive because there is no sign of decay or rotting as you would see on the forest floor. Look at this. The ground here is actually soft and squishy because all the leaves and stuff rots and decomposes here. Check this out. The only way to preserve a leaf before it rots is for it to be quickly buried by dirt and mud. How would nature move so much dirt and mud around? A flood. Hey, do you remember how earlier we were talking about how ants are found inside of amber? This is the same thing. Look. Here's another kind of fern. I was told my fossil fern is 300 million years old. But look, ferns are still ferns today. It doesn't look like they've evolved. I believe my fossil fern was just quickly buried at the time of the flood. I'm gonna write that down in my journal. What the fossil record actually shows is that plants and trees appear all of a sudden fully formed, fully functional, and highly complex. Well-preserved plant fossils all over the world show us they were all buried quickly by water. It sure looks like the evidence we find in botany does not support the idea of evolution. The Bible says that on the third day of creation, God created the plants and the trees in many varieties. Wow, I'm still amazed at how big those trees are. If you're a bird that is afraid of heights, you'll definitely want to find a different tree to nest in. You know, I never thought how trees and plants could provide so much evidence about when God created the world. I'm glad that God left us a bunch of clues to help us understand about the past. Well, I need to finish up my report and send it to HQ. And remember, if you want to read it, just go to our website. The Bible tells us, after the flood, trees and plants started growing again. The fossil record shows plants appeared all of a sudden, fully formed. Bristlecone pines seem to be able to live very long lives, but we don't find plants that are so old that they don't fit with the biblical account. Fossilized plants all over the world show us they were quickly buried by water. I am amazed that some of these trees out there seem to live forever. You know, in the beginning when God created humans, He made them perfect. He breathed life into us so that we could live forever. It's like His breath equals life. Unfortunately, Sin messed things up and brought death to the world. Without God, sin and death take over. With God, 
we have a life full of peace and joy. Choose to breathe in God every day. The good news is that God wants to make us perfect again. He wants us to go and live with Him forever in heaven. That's where I want to be. I hope you'll join me again for our next assignment. And remember, God the Creator loves what He creates, especially you. Good night. Hold on! Don't leave yet! We've got bloopers! Déjame dejar, déjame dejar, de, 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 that's all folks. <laughs> Ready? It's <laughs> backwards. It's stuck in there, and it, what am I, what is it? dies. It dies. It dies. <laughs> This isn't a rainforest. There's a car coming, and it's very noisy. <laughs> Get it open. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs>